Um, so I'm now going to hand over to Lynn. So thank you very much, Lynn. Perhaps you could start just by introducing yourself. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm Lynn. Um, obviously, otherwise you've introduced me to somebody else. Um, I'm losing my virginity today doing a Zoom presentation with you all. I'm a clinical nurse specialist, advanced nurse practitioner over in Castle Hill, which is in Cottingham in East Yorkshire. Um, I'm also a psychosexual therapist and I do say um, a lot, so please don't count how many times I say it. I nearly said it again then, just thinking about it. I've been a nurse specialist for 20 years, maybe a bit longer. Um, so I've obviously been looking after women with various gynecological cancers. One of my special interests obviously is ovarian. I've been a psychosexual therapist for about 10 years and that came on the back of my patients needing extra help and extra support. So I'm a sexual therapist across the board in men with women, um, with men who want to be women, women who want to be men, sexuality, everything you can imagine to do with sex and relationships. I've got a presentation that I'm going to do today, obviously. It is one that I normally do face to face. So I usually get a lot of interactions or hope to get a lot of interactions from it. So hopefully um, it will marry across to um, doing it online. So please be kind to me. I'm nervous um, about doing it this way. So be gentle with me, just like you guys may be nervous in your relationships or with sex. And you want someone to be kind to you, well, I want you to be kind to me. Okay. Are you happy for me to start, Soraya? Right. So, fingers crossed it goes right. It did go right when we practiced um, that one from the beginning. Right. Thumbs up. Uh, perfect. Thanks, Lizzie. So um, I've been asked, obviously, to talk about relationships and intimacy. Obviously, we are in very uncertain um, times. So how things have been three, four months ago are very different for lots of people now. Um, so the things I'd like to cover, so I'd like to look at relationships, the potential impact of ovarian cancer on your sexual health, on body image, on sexual identity, and on sexual function and hopefully to give you some practical advice on how to manage any sexual difficulties you've got, any communication difficulties, um, and answer the, any questions that individuals may have specifically to address some of their issues. It feels really bizarre because I can only hear my own voice, so, um, and I hope you can understand my accent. So a bit of a disclaimer. I use humour to break the ice, so I do use lots of um, joke cartoons within here. It's not because I'm trying to minimise the topic, it's because I'm trying to normalise the topic to make it something that we can talk about, that we are open about. Um, I think we all find it difficult to talk about sex and intimacy when it's about ourselves. Um, I do it if it's a living, so for me it's quite normal. My poor kids, my daughters are 21 and they're 18, 19 now, and they're just mortified by how open we are. But if you worked in our office, um, sex is extremely on the on the agenda for discussion. Um, if people walk in, the poor workmen come in and we had a, one of the girls had a big crack in the ceiling, and you can imagine the comments that we were making about that. So the workmen used to, um, yeah, they, they changed our crack to a box bit inappropriate I suppose. Within the presentation I'll predominantly be talking about same-sex relationships however anything we talk about can be crossed for same sex. Did I say mixed sex relationships? Anyway it doesn't matter. Um, so a lot of the sex we're talking about will be in relation to penetration and that could be whether you're in a same-sex or a, um, a heterosexual relationship. Um, I'll be using words that you might think, oh my God, I don't like to use that word, but I will be using them to say like vagina, clitoris, um, penis, whatever. Um, and I apologise if anybody's upset by any of the words I use. So moving on. So looking at relationships. I think one of the biggest relationships we have with anybody is the one that we have with ourselves. Well, the person that we probably speak to the most in our heads or sometimes I speak out loud to myself, I don't know whether you guys do, 
Um, we have relationships with food, with um, how we're acting, our behaviour. We do lots and lots of self-talk. We've also got relationships with other people, with other things like I've got my two dogs sat in here with me at the moment. So if they start to bark at some point, I apologise. But I've got a really good relationship and find lots of um, comfort from having my dogs around me when, when I'm feeling sad or down. I've got relationships with um, my family members, my friends, intimate relationship with my partner. So I think there's lots and lots of different relationships which um, under today's circumstances are maybe a little bit different to what they were three, four months ago. And it might be that the only person that you've got the opportunity to talk to is, is yourself at the moment if you're in isolation. Oh, I'm pressing the wrong button. I'm sorry. I'm just trying to see where I'm going. This isn't something that I would have maybe even thought about before isolation, before lockdown. Um, you know, we can be surrounded by people and feel lonely. Um, I think about somebody recently who's in a relationship that's not going as they want to. And they said that when they were on holiday, they felt as if they were there with their husband and felt as if they were totally and utterly isolated and alone and when they were in bed with them at the moment they've never felt more alone the relationship has since ended and she no longer feels lonely she feels content and happy that she's not um not necessarily that she's not in the relationship because she definitely wants the relationship but she no longer feels totally isolated and on this island with herself even though she's been surrounded by other people so when we think about um, being alone, sometimes it's that peace when you just sat and you're content and you're just happy with yourself. Um, whereas loneliness is circumstances that you don't particularly want, that you feel disconnected, that you long for a connection with other people. It can be feelings of depression. Um, and I think it's very much magnified at the moment when the world's as it is when we can't go out and meet somebody and have a cup of tea and sit and talk and it might be that you're you're on um total isolation total lockdown and um shielding so you haven't got the opportunity to go and meet friends um or family so i think there's lots of um issues of around loneliness at the moment whereas previously you might have been content to be alone but at the moment you're not Sexual health is a human right. When I think about sexual health, um, I don't just think about sex. One of the things that we will talk about is sexual intercourse, but sexual health isn't just about sex. It's an emotional and mental well-being, as you can see that from the slide. I don't need to teach you how to read, hopefully. Um, it's not just an absence of disease or dysfunction. Hopefully, um, with the right support, your sexual rights will be um, to be able to, to retain them and maintain them. Um, that you'll be treated. When I did my dissertation, one of the things that um, came up in a lot, a lot of my reading was the patients felt that they weren't able to go and ask somebody for help, that they weren't be able to be seen as a woman anymore, or to express their, their fears of um, the lack of intimacy or pain when they were having sex. They're waiting for the health professionals to bring up the topic. When the health professionals thinking, well, they're not commenting that they've got any issues, so I were asked. So there was that that um, cavern of misinterpretation of. Um, I'm using some of my words wrong. My this headphones start doing the heading. Um, like a cavern of miscommunication where somebody wants an answer but they're not too frightened of asking but somebody doesn't think that they want something so it's missing communication between health professionals so um you do have a right to have a proper sexual health when you think about um our identity um and our sexual being it's the things that um god my brain's just gone sorry my brain's just gone whoa so the things that come into place are 
body and nature, the ideal of what your body should be like. Um, and that's probably being challenged from having ovarian cancer. Self-esteem, performance and your identity. I think that um, some people might find um, having cancer and facing that challenge a very positive thing. But a lot of people, it will challenge a lot of the um, their self-ideals and their image, what they, how they are to themselves. Body image, it's, it's not just about how you feel about yourself. Sometimes it's um, it's not based on, on fact. So um, other people may see us when we, we're dressed in, I don't know, our favourite dress and our hair's done and we look absolutely amazing to somebody else. We might feel that we we look um, drab and awful and it's your head that's giving you... Um, the impression some days we'll go out and we'll we'll feel amazing we'll feel fantastic our hair is having a great hair day another day we'll feel really awful and our hair feels to us that it's awful but it's exactly the same to other people so it's not necessarily that something's based on facts it's based, based on your emotions and what comes from inside sometimes it's learned from our surroundings that we should be and um, we're expected to look a certain way to dress a certain way to act a certain way it can change as you age. I mean, I am literally only 25. So, but, um, you know, if, if I think back to when I was younger, I think as we become older, we become more confident. But that's maybe generalising a bit too much. Um, there could be other influences. So biological influences. It may be that we've got um, more wrinkles now and so that changes how we feel it may be that you know at the moment if you think about lockdown a lot of people are able to go to the hairdressers so they've suddenly the hair's totally changed um and they've, they've now got more gray hair coming through or brown hair coming through or you know your hair's regrowing because um, your chemotherapy is finished and so your hair's coming back but it's coming back different it's coming back curly and wavy and coarser or thinner so your images may change because of um, other influences your identity is more than just um, your appearance it's also your perception of yourself this slide did talk about um, originally your perception as a whole intact person and I think sometimes having a very cancer, a lot of my patients, they don't feel as whole as they did before. Some do, some don't. Um, for a lot of women losing the uterus, um, having scars, having reminders um, of your ovarian cancer takes away some of that identity that you, that you are as a, a person or you were before. And trying to capture that back um, and live with this disease or with the side effects of this disease and the treatments that we've given can alter your perception. Before having cancer, you probably a lot of women um, take on so many different roles. So potentially mothers, the workers, the lovers, the friends. The Wonder Woman, they can do anything because that's what women do, don't we? We juggle all these different hats and all these different um, roles that make us who we are. And suddenly this can change because you're, we've taken control as healthcare professionals because suddenly we're telling you that you're ill, that you need treatment, that the treatment might go on for years. Um, for some people it might be that their disease is curable. For some people it's about long-term management. Um, so lots of influences throughout and um, the disease process can really change all your perceptions because you may have to stop work. You may change your role so you need help, you need care, you need somebody to hold your hair back if you're feeling sick or shave your hair because it's falling out. Um, and it might be that things are on hold for a while and you can get back to who you where and the jobs that you do as as you go through your treatment but it may be that some things need to change um, indefinitely
I found this article and I thought it was really, really, really powerful of a, a young woman who obviously had advanced ovarian cancer who blogged her way through um, the treatment and how it just demonstrates, I think, I, I know a picture is just a, a picture, but some pictures I've seen a million words. I don't know how she, she copes emotionally behind all this, but um, for her it was a very positive experience to share. Um, and also the picture down the bottom of a, a woman who's hiding her stoma um, underneath this flower, which obviously from the picture demonstrates that she, she's got body confidence that she's um, that, that she's been able to adjust to um, her circumstances. I do know that we can have a picture on a, a photograph with a smiling face that be broken behind the picture, but I just think it demonstrates how um, for some women there is the ability to to present this um, face of positivity. So I'm going to move on a bit to um, more on the sex and intimacy. Again, as I said, I might be using, well, most of them will have a, a cartoon, so I don't think there's any really rude ones. I think they're all just a bit tongue in your cheek. So when we think about sex and intimacy, um, some people just class sex as sexual penetration as um as the act of intercourse but sex is so much more than just the act of intercourse it's the the touch the holding hand and um, the kissing intimately the touch often though if if people are frightened of being intimate and being sexual then the intimacy would go so if you're frightened that if you kiss your partner that they're going to expect to have sex and you don't want to have sex because it's painful and um, women tend to, women or men it just depend on who's got the difficulty with draw intimacy so suddenly yeah you may be sat on the sofa just holding hands or you may be sat on the sofa different sofas watching different tv programs so you might be there together but not close and intimate so what comes first i think um without some intimacy you're not going to be able to be sexual um, women often are more um, in the head they're more emotional they, I don't want to generalise but women need to feel loved to be sexual um, whereas men often need to have sex to feel loved so sometimes there might be that um, difference of approaches so if, but through my therapy I have discovered that that is a big generalisation because I think it goes for um, it can be the other way around in a relationship. So which comes first? Without the intimacy, you're not going to want to be sexual. But for some people, sex is the intimacy. And also you don't need to be with a, a partner to want to be intimate with yourself. Um, I know that masturbation is a, top, a taboo subject um, for lots of people, but you know, it's normal and natural to want to touch yourself, um, but that might have gone out the window with, with sexual desire um, generally. So. The changes as a result of ovarian cancer might be a result of changing lifestyles anyway, um, relationships change anyway. But there could be physical changes, psychological changes, and relationship changes. So the physical changes I'm obviously going to go through, and um, some of the psychological changes we go through as we go along. And say relationships often, um, I think with a cancer diagnosis, your roles potentially change, and at certain points it could be that your intimate partner becomes. Um, more of a carer than a lover and trying to get that back um, can, can have to be difficult. For some people though it can be a very positive experience and um, having a cancer diagnosis can bring you closer to your partner. It can, it can change your communication because your communication can, can improve, it can get worse but it 
can improve. So it can be a real positive. Um, in some of the research, some women use sex to make them feel alive still and still feel feminine and still feel um, sexy, want of a better word. So it can be positive, but it can also be negative. And obviously I'm going to be looking at more of the negative um, situations and how we can try and improve them. This feels so strange just talking at myself. I feel like I'm talking at myself all the way through. So if anybody wants to stop me and say something, please message Soraya and wave at me because I can see it's all on the side. So um, physiological changes. So physiological things that can um, affect sexual function. So it could be pain. You maybe have it might be uncomfortable and painful to have sex. That doesn't necessarily mean um, just pain in your pelvic organs. It could be that I don't know you've um, you've pulled your back, and so you've got back pain. It could be pain that was already there prior. You could have arthritis, so you know that in the morning you're going to be your joints are going to ache and they're going to be stiff. So you're going to be in pain, so you're not going to feel um, sexual. Vaginal capacity can change. I've got a slide a bit later on where I show that as people um, go through the menopause, that potentially the vaginal, um, the walls get thinner and narrower. And it could be that you've had some surgery that's reduced the vaginal capacity. You may not lubricate as well. When women go through the menopause, lubrication um, reduces potentially. And also when you think about stress, anxiety, um situation if you're frightened of being sexual then your body doesn't naturally lubricate as well as what it would do if you were um fully aroused so maybe altered anatomy or there probably would be altered anatomy because you probably had a hysterectomy we've removed ovaries and um, you may have stomas you may you know you've got scars so there's lots of things that may be changed physically um and also lots of changes within the nerve systems, altered blood flow, hormonal changes because of the treatments you've had or because you've had your ovaries removed. And for some women, not essentially with a very cancer, but some of the other cancers, they may um, develop into being, which is swelling of the legs. Psychologically, you may have low mood, you may have depression, there may be some altered body image or self image. There's that fear of pain. If you know that it's going to be uncomfortable the last time you have sex, then you're frightened it's going to be hurting the next time. The fear of cancer. Some people believe that um, they may catch cancer from being having sex. Um, so there's lots of fears around um, the diagnosis and potentially the treatment. Fear of stomas leaking. I once had a lady refer to me for um, sex therapy. I mean, she hadn't had ovarian cancer, she'd had um, cervical cancer. But during intercourse, the first time she tried to have intercourse, she actually pooed herself. Um, and so suddenly she was so frightened that that was going to happen again that it just totally put her off sex. Um, once we managed to sort out her issues with. Um, the side effects of the radiotherapy and she was no longer um, incontinent feces then the sexual problems disappeared. Drugs such as um, the SSRIs and antidepressants they low in sex drive and also opiates may be less sensitive as well. Your interpersonal so within your relationships and um, as we've already said about role changes that you become less of the partner and um, needing more help. Fear of causing pain, so it might be a partner's frightened of hurting you. There may be existing partner difficulties. Your relationship may have been quite difficult before. It doesn't mean to say that it's going to suddenly be better that you, because you've got cancer, so it might be that you've got existing um, related difficulties with your partner. As I've said already about fear of catching cancer, there may be anger and blame, and that could be either way. You may have expectations, so normally um, you have sex every Friday night and suddenly on Friday night it's the day after your chemotherapy and so you've 
you're not feeling so well, but it's Friday night, so you've got to have sex. So what expectations are there? And I have worked with people, and I work with lots of people in abusive relationships. So it might be that you're experiencing abuse, and that might have increased through um, through cancer treatment. It may be that it, it stopped. So there might be abusive relationships. And then obviously, um, it's who you are anyway. So your upbringing, your values, your beliefs. Um, it could be that you believe that as a wife, it's your um, duty to have sex, irrelevant of whether you want to or not, irrelevant of whether it hurts you or not. Um, you may be fearful that your partner will leave you if you're not being sexual with him because that's the, the expectation. Um, your reason for being sexual previously might have been to try and get pregnant if you've taken away that capacity so you now have um, mm -hmm. got infertility then um, there might not be a reason for you to be sexual anymore. Cultural beliefs, religious beliefs, so there's lots of reasons why um, oh, why your the essence of who you are might influence your sexual um, willingness, for want of a better word. So as I said earlier, there might be some physical changes. So I don't know, can you see the arrow? Sorry, nod to me if you can see the arrow as I'm moving it, yeah. So here, obviously this is still somebody who's got an intact uterus. This is actually endometriosis, but it's, it sort of like explains what I wanted to explain. So you can have things called adhesions, which are like really fine um, fibrous tissue that starts to connect um, tissues together that shouldn't normally be stuck. After you've had surgery or inflammation, because obviously cancer will cause inflammation, um, things can become stuck together. When you've had your womb removed, there is this space here that's left. Um, your vagina potentially will still be the same capacity. So your vaginas and um, some tissue. Please don't be offended when I say this, but it's a bit like having a flat sock that when you put your foot into it, it can expand. So it becomes a, a space as your vagina, but it's not essentially a space to begin with. Um, so your bowels potentially will come down and fill this area. Sometimes the vagina might be um, shortened because they may because of scar tissue or because they may need to take the top bit of the vagina off depending on um, where your cancer was. I can't see this one because you lot of it. Uh, there we go on this side. Um, so it may be that we've taken part of your bowel out, so you've got a, a stoma attached. Here again, we've got adhesions that might be stuck, in, and also around your vagina entrance, there may be adhesions. So adhesions will be uncomfortable if um, if they're disturbed or broken. I'm just putting. Sorry. I'm just, you probably have gone through the menopause. You may have already gone through the menopause before you have cancer treatment. However, um, in the literature that I did for my masters, there was a lot of women who expressed that they're going through a second menopause. So this, although they'd already had the hot flushes and all the things that went with menopause the first time, they seem to, to be experiencing it again. Um, now, you may be able to go on hormone replacement. There's different research at different times. And lately, we've started to use a lot more um, hormonal treatments for women with recurrent cancers in our um, hospital. So if your cancer is uh, estrogen dependent, it may be that you're not able to have hormone replacement. Um, and that's something that you obviously need to discuss with your um, oncologist or your gynecologist and somebody who specializes in menopause to see whether it's appropriate and safe for you to have HRT depend on, on your age and the um, potential benefits and risks. So through menopause, earlier I said about your vagina becoming thinner. So if you imagine this one on this side, it's um, before menopause, you've got nice, big, juicy, healthy tissue 
that gives you um, the capacity for your vagina to expand better. During menopause how, or after menopause, these tissues become thinner. Okay, there's not as much um, fluid in there. There's not as much tension. I mean, if you look at my hand, I'm of an age where about 20 years ago, if I went like this, my tissues would be nice and healthy and plucked up. I've actually put moisturiser on this morning, but if I hadn't put moisturiser on, my tissue is very frail. Well, it's not frail, because I'm, but it's frailer than what it used to be um, when I was 20 years younger. You may be able to have... Um, localized estrogen because it doesn't go into your bloodstream which would be systemic which would then influence um, any cancer because it literally stays within this area but it might be that you need to use some vaginal moisturizers i'm not advocating any specifically but um yes do a a vaginal moisturizer that I use daily it's a bit like putting face cream on I put my face cream on every day if I don't then um my skin's really dry and a bit shriveled up obviously a bit like this um red pepper up here so vaginal moisturizers are something you would use daily um during intercourse or penetration then using the lubrication would also help but i'll go through that when we get back a bit further on when we go into the pain um i've got a slide on pain and how to help with pain during this course so sexual desire and willingness lots of people lose their sexual desire anyway um not just because they've got cancer not because they've um gone through the menopause it can just be for whatever reason and um, the relationship when you first with somebody you do have potentially that massive um sexual attraction that as time it's not that you're not attracted to them anymore it's just that your spontaneous sex drive has gone and um, we tend to think about other things other things become more important and our reasons for being sexual um, can change as well if say we mentioned earlier about fertility so if you're trying to a baby your reason to be sexual might be that well time month i need to have lots and lots of sex but if that's gone that that might take away that um take away that drive to, to be intimate for some it's about emotional intimacy as we said before sex isn't necessarily just about penetration just about um intercourse so putting sex back onto the agenda and thinking about um, being intimate or being willing to be intimate. Just one sec, sorry. <coughs> if you um, are receptive and you have the appropriate stimulation, your body may then start saying, yeah, okay, this is working for me. But what do we mean by sexual stimulation? You may be reading um, some sex books. I think, I don't know if anybody's similar age to me, it's read Fifty Shades of Grey. Um, so when Fifty Shades of Grey came out, there was this massive drive where lots of women, I'm not saying every woman, but lots of women were really turned on by um, reading sexy literature. Women are more in the heads where men are more visual. So it could be that you're watching, I don't know, um, I don't know what age everybody is, so I can only see about four people here. So somebody who's really sexy, doing something really nice and intimate and loving, it might be sexual stimulus. Is somebody um, making a cup of tea and just telling you that they love you and giving you a little peck on the cheek just because they want to. So whatever, it could be a smell. could be when you go on holiday and you suddenly feel like that's relaxed. So your sexual stimulus can be anything that um, makes your body relax and start to be um what happens when you when you start to be sexual your body gets blood that comes down into pelvis and your pelvic organs are engorged with blood and you get these nerve tingling sensations that make you feel horny for want of a better word and um, it doesn't work for everybody because it might be that you're frightened that it's going to hurt so your body might not be receptive 
but with the appropriate stimulation, it might be slightly become aroused. And then whether that progresses to penetration or whether that's just a close intimate relationship and um, kissing, cuddling, touching, fondling, you get some emotional intimacy. So then you'd be more willing to be um, receptive to being intimate again. I think spontaneous sex drive is something that lots of people strive for. Um, but sometimes to put, putting it on the agenda and planning to be sexual in a time what's right. Um, so if you've got a stoma and you know that your stoma is really active at 8 o'clock at night, that's probably not the time that you're going to want to be sexual. But if you know your stoma is not active at 10 o'clock in the morning and your partner is able to be around at 10 o'clock in the morning, that might be a time that you're willing to be sexual. So planning things um, to work for you or after you've had, I don't know, if you suffer with pain, that like if you know that an hour after your pain relief, you're going to be okay, so making things work for you um, so that you're more receptive, more willing. But you might not want to have sex, and that's absolutely okay. You know, there's no reason that you should um, put yourself in a situation without that sex is an absolute must, that um, it's okay to not want to be sexual. Huh? So I, I mentioned about the right sexual stimulus. Um, there's a book, um, it's a thing called The Five Languages of Love. Um, I think it was Gary Chapman and one of the things that he talks about is um, there's five different um, ways that people can show their affection and um, so words of affirmation um, acts of service so you know if you're feeling unwell that somebody demonstrates that the caring by um, I don't know bringing you a glass of water and letting you have a lie in lots of different ways that we can show that we're there for the, the person that we care about and um, receiving gifts but i don't mean like diamond rings although that would be very nice but little notes or little texts little messages and um, giving them time some quality time and physical touch so it doesn't have to be that i always say not please don't be offended that this isn't a turn on that our boobs and our clitoris are on off switches. It could be that sensual touch could be just stroking someone's shoulder, stroking someone's face, just that closeness and that intimacy. Um, also see yourself um, put in, so when you think about um, sexy underwear, and lots of people's the, the thought process is, oh, I need to get dressed up for my partner. Well, hang on a minute. No, it should be for you. If you feel nice about yourself, if you if you put something on nicer, I don't know, matching set of underwear. And I'm not talking about people bras and clutch and snickers. I'm talking about something nice, that a nice matching pair without, I don't know. I speak openly here when I say some of my underwear is sort of like I only wear it for work because it's my big Bridget Joe knickers and my comfy bra that's a bit looser. But then having nice underwear at another time when I want to feel nice, I can go and have a bath and have a shower or a shower and I moisturise and I've got a nice smelling um, moisturiser on, put a nice perfume on, wash my hair, blow dry my hair. So the things that I can do for me that make me feel nice can then. Um, go across to the couple relationship. So if you feel nice about yourself and you feel sensual about yourself, then that can help with some of the arousal. And um, so doing, putting it on the agenda for you. So as we've just said about reading some literature, so putting it back on. So we think about sex rather than, oh, it's tea time, I'm gonna have my cup of tea and then, all right, it's seven o'clock, better go have sex. It's 
it's about build that build up that niceness. From a physical point of view, if your brain's not engaged and your brain's frightened, then it won't, your body won't work properly. So I'll say to my clients when people come in with the sexual pain, so you're walking in the room and I say, hello, how do you do? And I'll slap your face. You'll think, oh, God, that was a bit, mm, why has she done that? But she won't do it again, I'm certain. So the next time they come to see me, they walk in the room, I say, hello, how do you do? I slap your face. Suddenly thinking, oh, my God, she's going to hit me. The time after the walk in, it's sort of automatically hiding. So if you think that sex is going to be uncomfortable, your body's already moving away. Your brain's already anxious about something. If you know that your partner normally goes to bed at 11 o'clock and he's going to bed at 8 o'clock because you know that he wants to have sex and you don't want to have sex, suddenly your brain's already saying, oh, I don't want to be sexual. Um, and so it basically might just turn your body off. So trying to get your body and your brain back into gear so it's all harmonious. Um, I think this one shows you that our brains and our bodies are connected. So if our brains aren't engaged, our bodies won't be. If you've got a, the adrenaline flowing, which is the fight flight because you're frightened of being intimate, then the blood will stay where it needs to be. It's in your arms, it's in your legs, it's not in your in your pelvis where where it needs to be. But if you've got oxytocin and endorphins, which are like the love hormones, the niceness hormones, then um, that helps the, with the intimacy and the sexual um, contact. So the sexual pain, if I was to say now, right, you're about to, to um, have sex and it's hurt previously, automatically you probably find that your pelvis would be squeezing and your vagina would be closing. So it's a bit like doing your pelvic floor exercises. Your pelvic floor is this one that goes from here from your coccyx at the back to the pubic bone at the front um, and it squeezes and tightens. You're able to relax that um, and pushing out your, your tummy and opening your vagina helps when you've been intimate. For some ladies we have to do some vaginal training. I'm just conscious of the time. So some ladies we use these vaginal dilators to train to help them relax. Um, sometimes doing relaxation exercises and what I call reverse pelvic floor exercises. So when you push your tummy out, you can't if you, you can't squeeze your pelvic floor if your abdominals are pushed out. So that helps if you're going to be physically examined if you push your tummy out it helps with your vagina by um, relaxing the pelvic floor i'm just conscious of time um, when you post menopause it will take longer for you to orgasm but sometimes the aim of sex is an orgasm the aim of sex is sexual satisfaction so if you get that intimacy that closeness and um, not everybody orgasms. It might take a lot longer. It might take um, after play or for play. Um, so you might need a lot more stimulation um, for a lot longer. COSRA is the College of Sex and Relationship Therapist. Um, it's a register of accredited and qualified therapists and also here you can see there's some useful reading useful books over to you wonderful thank you so much that was great um so to get us started on our q a i think we've already had quite a lot of um questions coming in um, so just to reassure you as well that if we don't get to your question today that our support line is still available so you can speak to one of our nurse advisors about any concerns you might have um, so yeah the support doesn't end today if you'd still want some support um, and yeah just a reminder that you can also share any tips or strategies that have worked for you um, so to get us started wonderful um, so someone has mentioned um, about their 
lower sex drive. So how can I get my sex life back if I no longer have a sex drive after a total abdominal hysterectomy? Um, and someone else has mentioned in the comments um, that hormone blockers have affected their libido and their vaginal dryness as well. Is there any suggestions you have for that, Lynn? Yeah, both really. So how can you get your sex drive back? Um, putting sex back on the agenda. So thinking about sex, you know, like I said about reading literature, maybe watching, um, I don't know, romantic films. It depends on what it is that would float your boat. So starting to put that back on the agenda. Um, making your body more yours again. So I suggest to a lot of women that what we'll do is we'll go and have a shower, spend an extra five minutes. So just go in, wash your hair, wash your body, get out. To spend time, um, I know some people who are on treatment will have lost hair, but spend time washing with nice smelling. If you can't use soaps that are scented, use candles in the background. So um, when you're showering, spend an extra minute. So what does it feel like when you're touching your arm? What about if you're washing with a sponge? Um, asking, um, yourself, being aware of all your senses. So what's it smell like? What's it feel like? What's it touch like? How do you feel? So trying to get your body to be sensual for you. Um, as I said earlier about wearing nice underwear. Um, just trying to reconnect and set some time aside. So as I said earlier, it might be that you don't have spontaneous sex drive, but when you actually are willing to be sexual, that the intimacy and the touching um starts to, to re-engage your body open up the communication it might be really difficult to speak to your partner but watching something like sex education which is really really cringe worthy but it, it opens the conversation um because you know what they may be frightened they may have similar issues um so there may be hormonal medication that you can take but i would be very very careful with that without discussing it with somebody but re-engaging your body listen to your body being mindful um don't multitask when you're being sexual because the problem is people multitask don't they it's like okay i want to be sexual i want to be turned on oh, i need to do the shopping i need to do the washing but be aware of your partner's touch um and the dryness I usually recommend using um, vaginal moisturiser regularly, but then using the combination of the oil-based and the water-based lubrication. So oil, I excuse the crudity, but oh, I always think about vagina. Um, so put some oil-based on yourself and the water-based on your partner or whatever you're putting into your vagina. So it might be a willy, it might be a dildo, it could be anything. So whatever's going in, put on the the water based on there so i think of w for willy water base and it's like a slide and glide so using the combination but don't stop sex and say hang on a minute we need to put our lube on build it into it because otherwise it just you lose the flow so build it into the foreplay and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of foreplay and that doesn't just have to be clitoral stimulation because clitoris is really sensitive it might be the rest of your body your whole body being sexual Perfect. Thank you, Lynn. Um, just going on from that, someone's asked um, about vaginal, vaginal moisturisers and lubricants and whether they're prescribed through the NHS. Um, I can see someone else has commented back and said that they get it through their GP, but just wondering if you can shed some light on that. Yeah. Vaginal moisturiser is definitely prescribed and you should get it free. Water-based um, lubricants are prescribed. I've, I use, um, I get lots of free samples of Yes, which is why I I sort of like give send the samples to my um, patients, um, but there's other ones that you, um, you can use that silk, um, oh, lots. But I wouldn't necessarily buy them over the counter. The perfumed ones go for something specific. KY gel is not very sexy because we use that um, when we're examining people and stuff. So you know, it's, reclaim your body. Don't do anything that makes it medicalised because we've taken over your body and we're doing lots of things with it when you're at hospital. So when you're at home, make sure it's it's because you're at home and it's your body. Um, so any lube really, but yes, you can get, yes, is definitely prescribable and um, replenish is prescribable. Silk is on prescription as well. If you want to use oil base, that's not. Um, but a, a bottle will last you for ages. You don't need a lot. 
There is also um, silicone lube. There's a company called Permed. Again, that's not on prescription, but that goes a very long way. And if you're using it in the water and in the bath, be very careful you don't slip and break your leg. Okay. Okay. Sorry, I'm having some a bit of a delay there. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and just on that note, is there any um, around sex drive? Are there any risks to taking testosterone? And is it a safer alternative to estrogen hormone replacement therapy? I know that one might be a bit too specific, but if you could just let us know. Uh, well, testosterone can um, convert some into estrogen. Part of it, it's obviously not as high a dose, but testosterone can convert to estrogen. Um, testosterone in its own has been shown to help some people, but it depends on what your sex drive is like before. I, um, and I think you definitely need to speak to your pathologist, not your pathologist, your oncologist, um, gynecologist, and also somebody specialising in menopause because it's not on licence for, for use in women, it's only licensed for use in men. Um, and it might, depending on whether your cancer is hormonal driven, they might suggest not to use it. So it's definitely worth getting specialist advice um, from a menopause specialist. And I think that would probably be the only place that you'd be able to use it. I don't know whether it's diff different postcodes have different usage and um, different access to it. Okay, thank you. Um, someone submitted a question on Zoom as well, um, whether you could just speak about your experience treating younger women going through surgical menopause and the effect that that might have. Yeah. Surgical menopause is obviously something that happens like that. It's over one well, overnight, over a few days, um, and probably hits people a lot harder. So, from the point of view of the hot flushes, um, I, I think you need to get the balance of how risky is the HRT. So, if you're looking at somebody who's thirty, it's what's the balance of what can they have HRT? Can't can't you have HRT because um, you're going to have a lot of years to protect bones and protect hearts with oestrogen um, and it might be that your oncologist or your pathologist and um, keep saying pathologist I don't mean that yeah. um, your oncologist or your gynecologist may not want you to have HRT at all but it might be that getting the balance and um, that the risks are outweighed by the benefits yeah that's the right way around um, if not beneflaxin low dose antidepressant will help with the hot flushes potentially um, a lot of mindfulness, so focusing on, um, so you're distracting if you're having hot flushes, lots and lots of foreplay, lots of use of lubrication, lots of mental connection with your body. Um, but I do think that if, you, if you're in your 30s, early for 40s, you know you've got a lot of years without any estrogen there, so it's worth asking whether it's appropriate that you can have HRC or not. Lovely, thank you. Um, I'm now going to combine a couple of questions, Lynn, so please bear with me. Um, so someone's asked about sensitivity um, and said that they don't seem to have any sensitivity during sex or penetration um, and that perhaps they're just they're worried about it hurting um, and wondering if that would, that's something that would get better or if it's just practice. Um, and then someone else has said bear with me while I scroll, um, just about how to give a partner sex that's not penetrative, um, if they're struggling um, to feel comfortable doing that, um, to make to help um, ensure that their partner's sexual needs are met as well. Um, so I think a few people have then commented how this is something of interest to them. Okay. Um, tell me the first one again, sorry. <laughs> um, one second. Menopausal brain, you see. <laughs> So the first one was about sensitivity. Sensitivity, yeah. About not having sensitivity during yeah. penetration. Yeah. Um, firstly, what was it like before? So it might be that you didn't have much sensitivity before. Um, some people, I've, I've looked after somebody who the vagina was quite flaccid before. Um, and so they needed to have some surgical repair to make it a bit tighter but it might not be that it might just be that it's not as sensitive now um exploring touch so being really really aware about touch um we do sensate focus where i would put somebody on a sex band so that they really explore the whole body so it doesn't just have to be the vagina and the 
the um, the clitoris that causes the sensation. It's the whole area. And if you imagine, excuse my crudity in my hand, but this is being the vagina, your clitoris is up here. The whole, so it's only the clitoral head that's up here. The whole of your vagina has got, um, the clitoris goes all the way around. It's a bit like a penis that splits off. So the actual tip of your um, clitoris might be way too sensitive. So you're needing to sort of like more explore the, the whole area. And it might be that you've got sensitivity of your thighs, of your knees. So making your whole body sensitive. Um, a lot of women don't feel sensation in the actually in the vagina um, because there aren't as many nerve endings within the actual vaginal tissue. So it's, it's more, the, more the outside. Um, the majority of women orgasm through clitoral stimulation rather than by penetrative sex. Um, if it's because of that fear of the pain, then there might not be that they've had enough um, foreplay enough um, time taken because previously they probably got aroused quite quickly or may have got aroused a lot quicker but because they've gone through the menopause um, because they've had surgery and because they're frightened of pain it will take longer to become aroused so foreplay will be essential to be um, lengthier so that they can get aroused but again it's engaging the brain but be mindful of what's happening to your body so you really focus on what's actually happening to your body as opposed to in your brain thinking it's going to go hurt, it's going to go hurt, it's going to hurt, so you're not going to feel anything below your waist. Um, and being, the other question was about being sexual without having penetration. It depends on if you're comfortable with oral sex. Um, it could be that you keep your legs closed and at the top of your legs, um, we can do so much with my hands here, but sit on my hands. So if you close the top of your legs and um, somebody can put the penis between the top of the legs rather than into the vagina. Um, if you're uh, if you are comfortable with oral sex but you're just not interest comfortable with um the whole penis going in, holding the penis so you're only doing oral sex on the tip of the penis. Um masturbation. So often you know what you like and your partner will know what he likes so getting him to hold his penis but with your with your hand on it as well so he can show you how he likes to be um masturbated how he likes to touch how how strong he likes to be held how gentle how fast so encouraging him to be part of it um but sometimes it's it's just the fact that you're still wanting to be intimate because when you're worried about sex and you don't want you to remove the intimacy, so um, I could just see a question coming up. And yeah, anal sex is another way if if that's something you're comfortable with. A lot of people aren't, but you need to use a really good lubrication and be very very gentle and take um, take your time. So not go straight for anal sex. Um, you need to build up to that because obviously you don't want to do yourself any more harm than than good. Harm than good sounds a bit wrong, but um, yeah. So any of people laugh at me because um, I read an article um, when I was in my sex therapy training. It was about um, gay guys having sex, and if you're a top, you're always a top, and if you're a bottom, you're always a bottom. And they even talked about armpit sex or using your boobs. You know, you push your boobs together. They can use that's quite a turn on for a lot of guys having um, friction of your breasts with his penis between them. Great, thank you. Um, I think we're oh, sorry. I've only just noticed that we're a bit over time, but um, so if we just wrap up with a final question. Um, so someone, I know we've touched on it slightly, Lynn, um, but just how to feel sexy when you have a stoma. Um, and the impact it might have on body image. Yeah, absolutely. Um, choose something nice to wear. You can buy some really nice underwear. So um, it doesn't have to be sexy underwear, as in, you know, Nicholas Brows or something, but you can buy um, a basque, a really nice basque, or wear um, a little cami top, a really nice, sexy, um, with a doesn't have to be sexy, but a real nice silky, um, chiffony cami top, um, or 
sexy nighty. I say sexy, but I'm on about sensual rather than sexy. But, you know, a little cropped um, baby doll pajamas, but without the the, the bottom bits. Um, just having a um, I told I said am um, a lot, didn't I? A chiffon or silk scarf that you can just lay across where the stoma is. You mentioned earlier that you know when your stoma is going to work the most. So avoiding the times when you know your stoma is going to be more active. But depending on what your stoma is, if it's midiostomy, that might be more difficult. But for some people, if they've got um, a colostomy, it might be that you can get a, a bung um, that you can... You can go without your bag and just put a, a a a plug basically into your stoma. I don't know whether they're still out there, but I know that years ago when I worked with stomas, some people they could use that. Um, some big knickers, but sexy big knickers. So to have a look around, focus on the other parts of the body. So it could be that um, I was working, I'm doing some work with a lady who's had a mastectomy. She's only really young. She's got really big boobs. Um, oh, she's got one big boob now and a scar on the other. So what we, we focus on is a shot of um, decolage. I think that's the posh word. But anyway, this area and the collarbones and the shoulders. So focusing on the areas of your body that are still beautiful. Your whole body's still beautiful, but that you still think is beautiful. And make friends with stoma because without your stoma, without being able to have that operation that gave you the stoma, you might not have been able to get rid of the cancer. And it, you know, it's probably there to save your your life, basically. So making friends with it. I don't mean saying hello, how do you do? Obviously, but um, but yeah, some so nice things to wear. Lace. You can even just make it. Um, an elastic type lacy thing that just goes around that you put on when you're being sexual. But concentrating on your whole body, on the good things. Great, thank you. Um, just a comment as well that's come in that someone's mentioned that there are very small bags um, that are particularly for swimming that might yeah. be useful. Yeah. Wonderful. So thank you very much, um, Lynn, and everyone for your lovely questions. Um, I think we'll conclude our Q&A there. Um, just before we close, though, I would like to do just a little moment of reflection um, to just have a think about what the main thing you'll take away from today is. Um, so anything that you've learned today or anything that's been particularly important to you. Um, and while you're having a think, um, you can obviously type those in for us. If you want to share, you don't have to. Um, but I just wanted to ask Lynn if perhaps you could um, share what you hope women will take away from today's session. Yeah. So I thought about this because obviously you mentioned it to me yesterday. Um, and I don't want to sound very cliche, but be kind. Be kind to yourself. Um, do the things that make you feel good, make you feel special. Um, because if you do that for yourself, then that will flow over to other people in relationships. Um, put communication on the agenda. So say how you feel. Ask how they feel. I think at the beginning I said, oh, God, I'm really nervous. I'm really anxious. And you could see that to begin with. I was like, blah, 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 and you were all very kind. Um, so, you know, it's, it's really important that you put yourself there. You're worth it. You know, be kind to you. Be like yourself because that will, will pass pass across to your relationships. And um, if you are alone and isolated, then reach out to people. Okay. Just to read some of the comments that have come in. Um, so a lot of people have just said, thank you, Lynn. So thank you, Lynn. Um, someone has said, thank you for such an open and helpful and honest conversation. Um, Someone has said um, their biggest takeaway is dressing up for yourself, having nice showers and buying underwear that makes you feel good. Um, someone's mentioned it's nice to be reminded that all my feelings, insecurities and challenges are normalised, knowing that others are going through the same. Um, is that? Um, someone said about putting sex on the agenda and really planning for it mentally, um, which is great. So thank you, ladies, for sharing your um, takeaways. That's really helpful. Um, and so just before we close, um, thanks again for joining us and we hope you enjoyed it and we hope you found it really beneficial. 
Um, if you have any further questions, I'd like to um, highlight our support line. Um, so actually, my colleague Rachel, I think, is in our in here with us. One second, I'm just going to ask her to introduce herself so that you know who you're speaking to, because I know that can help sometimes. Hi, Rachel. Do you mind introducing yourself? Hello, everyone. I'm Rachel. I'm one of the nurse advisors. Um, yeah, just to say that we are here on support line. You're very welcome to give us a call, um, either about things that have been discussed um, during the session today or anything else related to um, your experiences. Um, I'm here until the end of the day tomorrow and my colleague Val is back again on Monday and we would love to hear from you. Great, thank you. Um, so if you do want to call our support line, I will share that in an email with you after the session. But if you want to jot it down now, it's 020 7923 5475. Or if you prefer to write things down, which I know some of us do, um, you can go to targetovariancancer.org.uk forward slash support and you can then fill in a little form for us. Um, I will be sending out emails after today's session, perhaps later this afternoon. Um, I will be sending a feedback form, so we'd love to hear your thoughts on the session. Um, it's really important for us to have your feedback so that we can really improve our digital events for you and make sure we're providing the support you need at the moment. Um, if you'd like to re-watch the session at all, it will be available on our In Touch online community, which is on Facebook. So if you're a member of that, you should be able to see it on the main page. Um, if you'd like to join, I'll give you the option in the, in the follow-up email as well. Um, I'll also give you a bit of an update on our other digital events and things that we have coming up that might be of interest. So we hope to see you again soon. Um, so yeah, just a massive thank you again to Lynn for such an incredible session. I think, as someone said, it was just really open and honest, and I hope everyone's really benefited from it. Um, so thank you again, Lynn, and thank you to you all for joining. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Can I just say quickly, if anybody wants any specific questions answered, then I'm more than happy um, to obviously if you um, email Rachel, they've got my emails um, and they can send it directly to me because I think I'm on your expert panel anyway. So please, if there's anything specific that you want answering, if I don't know the answer, I'll find it out for you. So please feel free. And if there's anything that's really struck a bone that you want to speak about, then also you know, I'm available on holiday this week, but I'm back at work next week. So um, feel free. Great. Thank you so much, Lynn. Thank you, everyone, for joining and hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Take care.